November 22, 1963, a warm sunny day in Dallas, Texas, multiple shots ring out. Moments later, the President of the United States is dead. Two days later, the man responsible was also dead. The man who killed him, Jack Ruby, descended into an unfathomable mental illness and himself died not too long after. And as you'll see today, many other people connected in some way with the JFK assassination quickly bit the dust. Number 6. So what really happened to Jack Ruby? So what happened to Jack Ruby? How come he lost his mind after he killed Oswald? One man who'd done a lot of research on this topic and a lot of research into the Manson murders isn't quite sure, but does say some things look out of the ordinary. His name is Tom O'Neill, and he just had a book come out after researching the Manson murders for over 20 years. In a podcast, he said this about Ruby's meeting with Louis Jollyan Jolly West, a man that for a long time denied he was working with the CIA on mind control program NK Ultra. O'Neill said, My most important finding is that a CIA contracted agent or researcher for mind control became that witness's doctor right before he testified and told his story, and then he goes crazy. The problem is no one who worked in MK Ultra will talk about it. It would have remained a complete secret had the CIA got away with destroying all related files. We know that just before Ruby was to testify to the Warren Commission, West visited him in his jail cell. No other people were present. West said Ruby had gone mad and was a paranoid rambling mess of a man. We must remember here that prior to this, when West wrote to the CIA's mind control master, Sidney Gottlieb, he said his specialty was inducing insanity in people without their awareness. We know that after Ruby shot Oswald, some strange things happened. The police pinned him to the floor, and out of his mouth came these words, What am I doing here? What are you guys jumping on me for? It was as if he wasn't in control of himself. A psychiatrist later said that Ruby had suffered from a fugue state with subsequent amnesia. A fugue state is characterized by someone who suddenly loses their sense of themselves, having a kind of breakdown where they don't know what they're doing. Remember, no one had any idea that West had been working with the CIA on mind control. West tried very hard to get involved with Ruby, at one time asking Judge Joe B. Brown to appoint him on the case. According to documents that were found by Tom O'Neill a long time after the trial, West had been asked by someone to work on the case, but he never said who. At first, the judge refused to give West access to Ruby, but with some effort, West insinuated himself in the case. It was thought that perhaps West, with all the skills he had, could help Ruby recall the day he shot Oswald. On April 26, 1964, West boarded a plane and went to see Ruby. Not long after, West came out of Ruby's cell and stated the man had a complete psychotic break. West said that Ruby was positively insane. No one knows and will likely never know what happened in that cell. In a sworn affidavit, West wrote that Ruby was hearing things and seeing things going as far as to hide under his table because he thought all the Jews in the US would be slaughtered. West said that Ruby said he'd seen his brother tortured, horribly mutilated, castrated, and burned in the street outside the jail. West wrote that Ruby could still hear the screams of Jewish children being boiled alive. It sounded like a really bad trip. After that, any other doctor that met with Ruby came to the same conclusion. He had suddenly gone mad. Still, doctors who talked with Ruby before West had seen him had said he was absolutely fine, not crazy at all. West wrote, Tonight, my own findings make it clear that there has been an acute change in the patient's condition since these earlier studies were carried out. A doctor that had seen Ruby before and after he had met with West was astounded by the change. His name was Dr. William Beavers, and he wrote that there was a possibility that someone had done something to Ruby, perhaps given him some sort of very powerful drug. He wrote the possibility of toxic psychosis could be entertained, but is considered unlikely because of the protected situation. Obviously, Beavers could not have had an inkling that West was involved in a project that forced powerful drugs on unwitting victims and tried to mess with their minds. A good point is, what if he had known about West's involvement with the CIA's dark program? He probably would have looked into the matter further. What's even stranger is the fact that Ruby was visited by Dr. Werner Tudor in 1965. He made an evaluation and sent the notes to West so they could be submitted to court. West looked at the documents and he erased one part. It said, there is considerable guilt about the fact he sent guns to Cuba. Why did West expunge that line? Did he have anything to do with Ruby's breakdown? We don't know. There is a possibility that there is more to the story than we already know. After all, the CIA wasn't exactly forthcoming about its mind control efforts. Now listen to how three men all walked into a room one day and not long after were all dead. Number 5. Enter at your own risk The journalist Bill Hunter received some acclaim for writing Three Days in Dallas after the JFK assassination. He also wrote about Ruby shooting Oswald. He was one of the few people that actually got permission to have a look around Ruby's apartment right after he shot Oswald. 
In April 1964, Hunter was sitting at a desk in Long Beach Police HQ and he was shot. The gun of a policeman named Crichton Wiggins had apparently accidentally gone off and a bullet had entered the chest of Hunter, killing him instantly. The officer said he had dropped the gun. Investigators soon found out that there was no way that Wiggins was telling the truth. He admitted that he hadn't dropped the gun at all, but had been playing around with it when it accidentally fired. It's believed Hunter was still working on the case, and that's why his death is seen as suspicious by some of the JFK conspiracy fraternity. Ruby had been living with a man named George Senator. We've seen the court transcripts, so this is very much a fact. Senator said this in a court about Ruby. He was a good, sound American citizen, and politics, he never messed around with that. He never messed around politically at all. The majority was connected with the music industry, the nightlife, you know, his club, his competitors, what they were doing. It was because of Senator that Hunter was allowed into Ruby's room. Also allowed inside was Dallas Times Herald journalist Jim Cothey and Ruby's attorney Tom Howard. On the 21st of September 1964, while writing a book on the assassination, Cothey mysteriously died. Some sources say that he had been karate chopped to the neck, but other sources say that he was strangled. No one knows what happened, although Time Magazine in 1966 attempted to dampen the flames of conspiracy by saying the journalist was well known for hanging out with thugs. Time said police at the time said the motive was somehow connected to homosexuality, but didn't expand on that. We found a news clipping from back then with the headline, Newsman's Death Termed Murder. The police captain said this in the report. He could have been killed by a karate blow to the neck or have fallen and struck his neck on a table or a bedstand in the room where his body was found. The apartment had been ransacked, and there were signs of a struggle. Police in the end said it was a burglary that had gone wrong, although people have said it had something to do with the notes the journalist had written about the assassination or what he knew about Ruby. One year later, Howard also died. His death was ruled a heart attack, although as people are quick to point out, there was never an autopsy. Still, the New York Times wrote that he had died of a massive coronary infection, stating, Mr. Howard had been ill for several days but continued his law practice. He was just 48. As you'll now see, not only men tied to the case died. Number 4. Was this woman really going to crack the case? One journalist actually got to chat with Ruby and her name was Dorothy Kilgolfin. She was not so sure about the conclusions that the Warren Commission came up with, and she let it be known. She also published some of the commission's findings before they were officially released to the public. What happened to her? On November 8, 1965, she was found dead in her apartment in Manhattan. Prior to that, she had written that the CIA and the Mafia had worked together. Some people have also said that she was a CIA asset. After the assassination, she reportedly told her friends that she was going to crack the case. She said to one person, in five more days I'm going to bust this case wide open. By all accounts, she had given the first draft of her book to Florence Smith, her friend, and the wife of the ambassador to Cuba. When Kilgoffin's body was found, it was determined that she had died from an overdose of booze and barbiturates. According to some sources, she was found in a room she didn't go in often. She had a book in her lap that she'd already finished, and her reading glasses, which she couldn't read without, were in another room. As for Florence Smith, did she have those notes? No, is the answer. She died one day after Kilgoffin of a cerebral hemorrhage. She was 45. No book or notes were found. Still, she had reportedly been ill for some time and had only just gotten out of the hospital. There is evidence that Smith was friends with JFK and Mrs. Kennedy, and it's never been revealed where the New York Times got the information from about her illness and stay in the hospital. That's just what the paper wrote in her obituary. The next one has had conspiracy theorists talking for years, but they might have been seeing things that just weren't there. Number 3. The Benavides Brothers Then there were the brothers, Edward Benavides and Domingo Benavides. Domingo was one of the witnesses who saw police officer J.D. Tippett get shot after the assassination. Some sources say he testified that the shooter looked nothing like Oswald, but from what we can see, he just gave a vague description that could have been a lot of people. Some sources say that a dark presence feared that he would blow the lid on something, so he needed to be taken out. But he wasn't killed. Instead, his brother, who looked like him, was shot in a tavern in Dallas. But, and this is important, the brother was shot after the Warren Commission had people testify in court. Conspiracy theorists have argued that he was shot during the investigation, but we've actually seen his death certificate. Indeed, he was murdered on February 16, 1965. This means he couldn't have been taken out accidentally by someone who wanted to kill his brother. It's just another death that you could say is the type of thing to start making lights go off in someone's head. Now let's look how one official thought that the CIA took out JFK. Number 2. The Insiders 
Did a man who worked for the CIA have extensive knowledge about the assassination and know that his own team had done the job? The man was named Gary Underhill. According to some books, after the assassination, he said this to a friend, You're going to Spain? That's the best thing to do. I've got to get out of the country too. This country is too dangerous for me now. I've got to get on a boat too. I'm really afraid for my life. Oswald is a patsy. They've set him up. It's too much. The bleeps have done something outrageous. They've killed the president. The CIA denied that this man worked for them. But then the CIA, it has to be said, has always been very sparing with the truth. It's a fact that Underhill worked in the military intelligence service, so he is a person of interest. It's also stated by credible sources that he did actually say those things after the assassination. Shortly after, he was found dead in his house. According to the District of Columbia Department of Public Health, his certificate of death dated May 8, 1964 read that he shot self in head with an automatic pistol. Some people have remarked that he had been shot behind the left ear and the gun was discovered in his left hand. He was right-handed. But then, if he did kill himself, maybe he was an unorthodox kind of guy. Also, would CIA hitmen be that stupid? Now, we turn to the FBI and an agent named Gary Bannister. This guy was a serious anti-communist who later went on to form his own private investigation agency. He was accused by one of his colleagues of knowing about the hit on JFK being an inside job. This guy told a lot of people about that and he became a big part of the investigation. Bannister died soon after in 1964 from coronary thrombosis. He was 63. Number 1. The Lover According to various mainstream sources, a woman named Mary Pinchot Meyer was a mistress of JFK and a friend of his wife. She was also a good buddy of the wife of a very high-ranking CIA guy. In 1964, she was murdered and her death to this day remains a mystery. Her affair with the president had been a big secret, and so that information only came out later. As for her death, it was said the shooter must have had extensive training with the firearm. An African-American man named Ray Crump was charged with the murder, but when the case went to trial, he was acquitted. So why would someone have taken this woman out execution style? It's well known that she kept a diary, and in it were things that some people thought the world didn't need to know. After she was killed, people went in search of that diary. One of them was a CIA agent who was caught trying to break into her apartment, according to journalist Ben Bradley. But so what if the diary exposed the president? So what if he and his mistress smoked weed together in the White House? Did that really qualify for her execution? Well, some of the people believe that this woman knew too much, maybe more than has been let on, and that's why she had to go. It's also worth noting that after the Warren Commission came up with its report, she was very skeptical. Maybe that was one of the reasons why the agency was wiretapping her phone. This is all true, and you have to admit her death and the timing of it do sound quite suspicious. Now, you need to watch the JFK assassination, what really happened, or have a look at insane ways USA tried to take out Fidel Castro.